We're going to get started. Welcome to the IB webinar. Good afternoon and good morning to everyone tuning in today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tara. I work with IB, and IB is a community and business management software specifically for the needs of interior designers. And you can use IB to create and send proposals, create chair sheets, invoice clients online, track and bill for your time, all that fun stuff. And every Wednesday, we host a webinar for designers like you to learn about the different ways that you can manage your visit more efficiently and more profitably. So today, I'm really excited to welcome Chad Stark to the IB webinar stage. Welcome, Chad. Um, for nearly 80 years, Stark has built uh, a legacy on quality service and art, creating custom carpets and rugs. Uh, Chad is a third generation owner of Stark and maintains the company's founding mission in empowering the trade to create beautiful spaces. So today, Chad will focus on what attracts us to handmade products, durability and time mining expectations for different constructions, fibers, and dyeing techniques, uh, the processes used in rug creation and how they impact appearance, and ways to make custom projects successful. So the way things will run today, Chad will be presenting for the next 45 minutes and will answer all of your questions live at the end of his presentation. And for those of you who are you know, tuning in and don't know too much about Ivy, I encourage you to stick around after his Q&A. Uh, my colleague, Risa, will jump on and give you a short demo of what Ivy is all about. So without further ado, I'm happy to welcome Chad. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Tara. Um, so I will share my screen now. Great. Perfect. So thank you for the introduction, Tara. I'm super excited, everyone, for being uh, on the call and working with the Ivy community. I've been aware of what you guys are doing. I met Alex and Lee uh, a long time ago, and it's been, uh, it's been fun watching you guys grow and build such a strong community. So thanks for hosting me. Uh, and to my presentation today, it's called 10 Things to Know About Handmade Rugs. Uh, when I first joined the business about six years ago in a full-time capacity, I was overwhelmed by the assortment that was available in our showrooms. And it took maybe uh, three trips to India, Nepal, and China, looking at our different uh, manufacturing facilities across the different types of products that we make to really gain an understanding and an appreciation for all things handmade rugs. Uh, and so over the last two years, I've been working with our product development team on we registering this CEU course and trying to uh, communicate this knowledge with the point, with, or with the idea rather, that uh, we want all of you to be empowered with knowledge that can help make your business more successful. Uh, the more you know the, uh, and about the high-end products and the expensive things that you know, you're selling to your clients, uh, the more successful you can be. So today uh, we've broken down the handmade rugs into 10 categories of, of points, and uh, there's a lot more to know than just 10 things, but we'll get started. And if you guys have some questions at the end, as Tara said, we'll, we will answer them. So it's always important, I believe, to start in defining what is a carpet or a rug. And oftentimes, people think of carpets and rugs as two-dimensional, uh, like a picture. But in reality, it's, it's 3D because you have you know, the length and the width, but you also have the depth. And you know, we like to think of rugs more as sculptures for the floor than pictures for your wall. Because uh, as I mentioned, there's the length, width, and the height. But then the density controls uh, how, how tightly knit the design is. Uh, the design itself and the colors and tone all impact the final appearance, which to me feels more like a sculpture and a piece of art than uh, you know, a, a, maybe a print or something. Next, and one of the things that I really learned when I first came, I was very overwhelmed by the assortment, as I mentioned. I was very intimidated by the assortment. And so it's... It, the amount of product out there is intimidating, but it's important to understand why these products seem so intimidating. So first and foremost, you know, as I first learned when I went to India on the first time and I saw in museums these you know, thousand year old rugs, there's so much history involved in the art of rug making. Uh, and there's so many variations in terms of design, in terms of qualities, in terms of constructions, which, in, uh, which you know, inform the price points. There's so much knowledge out there uh, when it comes to antiques versus new rugs, I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. And it's understandable that it seems overwhelming to you, or it may, and to your clients, it may as well. Um, and so uh, there are other things that funnel that feeling of being overwhelmed. Uh, the process is very involved. There's no form of art that requires as many hands to touch it from the beginning of the process to the end of the process, which we'll be going through today. 
there, there's no form of art that uh, is so involved, uh, both from a knowledge of the material standpoint as well as uh, the processes involved. It's highly coordinated and it's highly collaborative, as I mentioned, but it's not just coordinated and collaborative within one location. Uh, everything from the showroom interaction that you have with you know, the sales staff at companies like Stark uh, to the communication Stark has with our overseas mills to the 10 to 50 potential locations that the mills use for different parts of the process, from the collection of the yarn in one area uh, to the dyeing of the yarn, to the weaving, to the drying, uh, to the washing, that all happens in different parts of a facility or it could even be in different parts of a city. Uh, and it's highly collaborative involving so many different people. The production distances are so far from where we are because of the handmade product and the communities of weavers, you know, generally are not in America, um, which make it seem intimidating because uh, it's so far, but funneled and fueled by the language barriers in these third world countries and these communities, whether it's Nepal, India, China, et cetera, and these really long production times. You know, we like to think, and I, and I talk to my account managers, there's no stronger way to validate your relationship with a design client than doing a custom project. Because if someone's willing to give us, you know, $5,000 deposit and wait nine months for a rug or six months for a rug, you know, that shows trust. And that's ultimately why we love custom so much at Stark is that, you know, we pride ourselves on the relationships that we build with our trade partners. And we see custom as the best vehicle, not only for the professional community as a whole to continue developing unique designs and beautiful spaces, but also as a great way to build strong relationships. So next, let's talk about the difference a little bit between handmade rugs and machine made rugs. Um, one interesting fact that I learned from our head of uh, production or head of uh, product de development and design was that uh, irregularity is visually stimulating biologically. So humans, when we evolved and we were in the hunter and gatherer stage of our uh, evolution and we, our eyes were trained to notice differences in the landscape. So if you were looking, you know, down you know, in a forest or you're in the desert uh, and there was a slight inconsistency in the landscape, our eyes were attracted to that because maybe that's a predator who some, or maybe it's food for us. Uh, so we've been trained biologically to notice these differences. And with, ha with handmade product, oftentimes, and, and especially in the case of uh, area rugs that are stocked multiple sizes, these differences are very subtle. The designs can be repeated, but you know, when you look at a, let's say a, a machine made a Wilton or some sort of machine made Brawldom carpet, when you have a box or when you have a line, that line is completely straight, you know, there's no variation. When you try to achieve the same thing, which again, we'll go into why in, in the next points, uh, that line might wiggle a little. And it's very subtle, and I'm sure many of you have seen that in handmade product before, but it really creates kind of a subtle beauty, uh, what we call kind of a perfect imperfection. Uh, and so in selling these handmade products to, to you or for you to sell to your clients, it's really important that, uh, your expectations are managed. And if someone wants a product that's completely perfect with you know, 90% angles and you know, straight lines and very clean, we can achieve that to an extent with handmade, but it's important understanding what the variation can be, uh, uh, communicating that to your clients, embracing it, and ultimately promoting it as what makes the product so beautiful. It's, it's the innate imperfection of something handmade not just in rugs, as I'm, you know, in paintings and in any type of handmade product, that innate uh, imperfection, uh, which is what makes it so beautiful. And so understanding that is what I think makes handmade rugs such a, a better value than machine made rugs. Uh, and also what you need to know to make your project successful. So now that we have a little bit of a background on what rugs are, uh, you know, why handmade and, and what attracts us to them and why they're so intimidating, Let's get into kind of the details of the production. And you know, one of the most known things when it comes to handmade rugs is construction. Uh, so when we say construction, first I wanna start uh, before going into specific constructions uh, and some of the implications from a pricing or a timeline uh, or a durability standpoint, I think it's important we start with some definitions of terminology. So first let's start with uh, the quality or the knot count or the stitch. So essentially, you know, I always like to use the analogy, and I have a technology background, so I always like to use the analogy of a TV. You know, there's, there's HD TVs, right? You have 1080p, you have 4K, you have standard definition. And what that refers to is, you know, how tightly 
uh, how close together the pixels are that show the light, right? It, the more defined it is, the more high quality it is, the more pixels there are in a small space. So rugs are the same in the quality or the knot count. It, it describes the density of the fabric and kind of the matrix as you put it up, how close together everything is. Uh, knot count specifically refers to knots per inch. So if you take a square inch, how many knots for a hand knotted product are within that area? Uh, next, let's talk about the weave for a second. Uh, so the weave refers to the technique used to create the quality. So the, the qualities we're going to go into are range from knotted qualities to tufted qualities uh, to flat weave qualities. And so as we go forward, I'll be talking about the different types of weaves. Next is uh, what essentially the weave goes on top of. The, the, what holds the, the design and the fibers in place is the backing, which is essentially a warp and a weft. So the warp refers to, as you can see on the picture on the upper right, the warp refers to kind of the vertical uh, backing, and the weft refers to the horizontal backing, which you can see. Um, and the, how close together those are impact the knot count, but that's not the only thing. You know, and I'll get into that more, but the density of the weft, which is controlled by kind of a beater after they do each row, which again, I'll show you, uh, there, there, are all, there are many things that control the knot count, but the warp and weft is kind of the, the starting point. And you might be wondering why I have a picture here of someone putting bricks down, um, but you kind of have to think of rugs, a good analogy is you think of it like bricks, right? So if the knot count is the bricks and how many bricks are in a certain area, uh, you look at the weft and that's the mortar holding them in place. Uh, and so you put a row down of bricks and then you put more weft down uh, or more mortar down rather to hold them in place and cement them in. The hand knotted product and handmade product generally follows this as a similar analogy. So now let's go into kind of different types of weaves as it relates to construction. So first and kind of, you know, one of the, the most common types of, uh, or one of the most historic maybe is a better way to say it, types of weaves is a classic knot. Uh, so essentially there are two types of classic knots. There's a Persian knot, uh, which is asymmetrical, and there's a Turkish knot, which is symmetrical. Uh, the illustration on the right helps show you kind of on an individual weave basis, on an individual knot basis, uh, what it looks like. But the best way to learn about these types of products and everything that I'm really talking about is to stop into a, to a showroom and seeing this product in, in person, touching it, looking at the back, looking at the front, bending it so you can see kind of the where the, the knots start and, and stop and where the wefts are. Uh, those are all better ways, in my opinion, than a presentation or anything on a screen to learn about the product. But here, uh, we did, did as good a, as a job as we can uh, using a screen. And one important thing to note about knots, in general, all hand-knotted product, they don't have a, a true backing. They're, they're knotted onto the backing or onto the weft and the warp, but they're not solidified into place by a latex or, or anything like that. Uh, because each knot is individual. So if you think of a sweater that you have, and some of you might be wearing sweaters, not in New York, it's 100 degrees. Um, but you know, if you have a sweater and it starts to unravel a little bit, if you pull it, the whole thing starts to unravel because the yarn itself is connected throughout the entire sweater. With hand-knotted product, each knot is individual. So you could cut a hand-knotted rug in half and it's never gonna unravel because the knot is what holds itself in place. So when you look at the Persian knot and it creates this asymmetric knot where they're essentially wrapping a strand of yarn around uh, and in between uh, two uh, warps versus and a Turkish knot, which is kind of wrapping it around two and then pulling it up in the middle between the two warps, um, those knots are individual and hold themselves in place. So since these knots hold themselves into place and you know they require so much uh, in each knot, this is a medium to slow production uh, as it relates to different types of weaves which generally, depending on the quality, can take anywhere from four months to nine months just for weaving. And obviously the weaving time uh, is very dependent on the size. You know, it's gonna take a lot longer for a nine by 12 rug than a six by nine, which is half as much uh, square feet. So um, in the world of rugs today, um, Persian knotted rugs are a little more common. Different areas of the world have learned how to do Persian knots. Uh, Jaipur is a huge Persian knotted uh, area that has amazing production, gr great quality control, uh, very accurate when it comes to custom and made to order products. And Stark uses a lot of production in Jaipur uh, for our programs and custom. 
uh, but Turkish knots, uh, they are, you know, it, it's, it's not as common, but both from a durability standpoint and production standpoint are very, very similar. Uh, one also important thing to note before we go on to the next knot is both of these types of knots are cut piled only. So as I'm sure many of you uh, are aware, when you look at yarn, uh, depending on how the light reflects off of it, it changes the color. So we have many products that uh, it's one, one color of yarn, and if it's a, a combination of cut and loop pile uh, in, the, in the construction, it looks like it's two colors when in reality it's one. Uh, so with the per a Persian and a Turkish knot, you can only achieve uh, a cut pile. But there are other knots where you're able to achieve an, a loop pile. Uh, so the next knot we're going to talk about is the Tibetan knot. Uh, so this is the, the main area for production for Tibetan knots is uh, Nepal. And we do most of our Tibetan production in Nepal, but they also have a quality which is we call Indo-Tibetan, which is a Tibetan style weave, but done in India. And there are pros and cons for each area. Uh, Nepal, we feel it has more uh, control, or we have more control in terms of the quality, in terms of the color matching, in terms of design matching and for straight custom. Um, but there are obviously some advantages in India from a price perspective. It's a little less expensive working with some of the manufacturing communities in India for this type of product. Um, but again, the trade-off is you might not be as controlled when it comes to quality. So what makes this knot primarily different than uh, the Persian knot or the Turkish knot is that rather than weaving the individual knots around the warp uh, and then going to the next knot, there is a rod used in the production. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to explain um, and it's much easier to understand when you see it. You know, one of the things as a follow-up to this webinar that you will all be receiving uh, from Tara or from Ivy will be a resource of different videos that uh, we've made as a company to help educate people on these different types of uh, knots or, you know, one is a video that I took in when I was in Nepal. One is uh, the first Instagram story that Stark did while I was there. I did a day in the life of me in Kathmandu, which was very fun. Uh, and then we also made a video about Stark's uh, process for doing custom with clients from the showroom interaction through the delivery. Um, and so those videos help illustrate some of these points. When I do this CEU presentation in person, I always play the video at the end. Um, but since it's a webinar, we're not really able to do that. But I, I strongly encourage you guys to watch these videos, uh, which you'll get links to. So again, going back to a Tibetan knot, uh, this is used creating a rod. So essentially, what, what creates the ability for loop and cut pile is it's one continuous piece of yarn that essentially is getting knotted around each, uh, around each warp. And at the end, once the weaver or weavers, plural, go across the entire width of the rug, the rod is then pulled out. And when the rod is pulled out, depending on what they want, cut or loop, there's either a, there either is a blade on the rod or there's not a blade on the rod. And if there is a blade, when they pull it out, it cuts all the loops. When there's no blade, they pull it out and it stays loop piled. And as you can imagine, the thicker the, the, the rod is, the bigger the loop is and the higher pile it is. So if you look at a product on the right, you know, it's, as you learn more about rugs, it's very easy to identify this product as a Tibetan knot because it's the only type of knot that's able to achieve a design like this with the texture like this. Um, so, and, and it, as it relates to kind of the world of rugs and, you know, the trade vendors and Stark specifically, Tibetan knot is one of the more common, uh, more common than the Persian and Turkish knot. And from a, it's a little faster, there's more design flexibility, but again, I'll, I'll, when I go through these weaves, I'll summarize all of them for you uh, in terms of some of the uh, things to be aware of as you're doing projects. So next uh, is the flat weave. So flat weave is a type of construction that doesn't have knots or pile. And if you think of back to my brick analogy, there's really no bricks, it's all mortar. So it's flat, it's because there's no knots, uh, it's done on a different type of loom, it's either a vertical or a ground loom. And the yarn, if you look on the right side uh, where I have that graphic, uh, the yarn is passed between the warps and kind of woven, uh, which makes means that the, uh, the weft and the construction, so to speak, is connected. So unlike a uh, knotted product where each knot is individual and the durability is extremely high, where it could last, you know, tens, if not hundreds of years, um, 
this is a little less durable, but again, it's less durable and less expensive because it's a lot faster. Uh, so depending on what you're trying to achieve from a design perspective, as well as maybe your timeline and, and the, the pricing requirements for your projects, uh, it's a great alternative. But again, important in understanding the limitations is, is extremely important. Next, we'll talk about kind of a, a, a version of a flat weave uh, is a sumac. So this kind of exists somewhere in between a traditional flat weave and a hand knotted rug in that it's not just wove, the, the warp is not just woven uh, between the webs, it's kind of stitched around them. So if you look at the infographic on the right, you can see you know, the, the colored uh, warps, the, the pink one or the pinkish shaded one and the green one, um, they're kind of going around and they're getting wrapped and stitched around two individual warps and then it continues. So it's still continuous, um, but it's, it's more durable than what we looked at last where it's you know, only woven versus stitched, but it's not as durable as something like this or something like this in the different types of knots. And again, there are always trade-offs, right? So because it's not as, it, it's faster, which makes it more, it's faster than hand knotted, which makes it less durable, but it's slower than flat weave and it makes it more durable. But again, there's more things than just the weave that determine these things. This is just one factor that uh, impacts it. Next, and the last construction we're gonna go over is, is not necessarily a weave per se. Um, it's the so tufting and weaving are fundamentally different. Uh, and so hand tufted is a quality that uh, is another great option as it relates to custom handmade product because uh, it's, the production is faster. Uh, it has certain design characteristics that are not, uh, that, that are different with hand knotted. So for example, with a hand knotted rug, you know, knots are directional. When you're knotting a rug, you know, there's direction to it. And I'm sure many of you have walked around a rug but with a client looking at it, and especially with the shinier fi fibers like silk, uh, looking from one side, one side uh, the rug can look really light, and when you walk around the other side, it can make it look really dark. And that's again because how the light is reflecting off the yarn. Uh, so tufting is different in that there is no light and dark side because there's no direction to the weave. Uh, so the tufts are essentially inserted into a, a backing. So there's a vertical loom. They set up a screen which is a, uh, with a drawing on it. So the, how they know where to put the design is they essentially draw. Uh, on the screen to scale to size. And then they use a tufting gun uh, with, to insert the yarn into the back based on the design. So because they have the flexibility of doing it in any way that they want, there's no, they, they can put the direction of the design in, in any way. So they can do a, you know, a straight across, so the direction is like that. They can do it straight up, so the direction is like that. They can make curves or circles or things like that and, and, and to hit the design in a much easier way than hand knotted and in a much faster way. And right when, it is, when the design is complete, then a backing is put on to hold the design and the yarns in place. And just like the Tibetan knot, you have the flexibility here of doing cut or loop. Uh, so the inf infographic on the right kind of shows you the foundation cloth is the screen, what I was referring to, which is usually on a vertical loom, so it's going up. Then someone generally is going with this hand tufting gun, as I mentioned. Uh, and then once that's complete, they put a scrim on the back to hold the design in place. They back the rug, uh, they put latex, and it really uh, holds the design in place. So it's faster production, but uh, there are trade-offs uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve from a design perspective. So to summarize and kind of go over the, the main takeaways as it relates to these constructions and these weaves. The classic type of knot is the most durable uh, and the longest production time, uh, and not necessarily the most expensive, but those two, the, the time frame and the durability in terms of the, the density impact the price. Following the classic knot would be the Tibetan knot, which gives you a little more design flexibility, which you can do a little faster, and was still just as durable really as the classic knot, it's just a faster production, but the integrity of the weave is very similar, if not the same. And then we go to flat weaves, sumacs and tufted. Uh, flat weaves are the shortest production time, as I mentioned, uh, with medium durability. Sumacs take a little longer than flat weaves, and they have medium to high durability. And then going back to tufted, that is 
uh, when you look at a ratio of the durability to the production time, that is the best in that sense because it's a quick weave, but it's highly durable since it's backed and the latex holds the product in place. So as you're going through your projects with your clients, uh, it's good to note these different constructions, these different types of weaves, uh, and then the implications from a time perspective and a dur durability perspective that they all uh, have. So next, let's go into the materials. And as I mentioned, um, the rug, there's so many different things from the, weave, uh, from the weave perspective to the materials perspective to the design perspective that ultimately uh, inform the end result of the product that you get delivered to you and your clients. Uh, and the material process and the piece of the puzzle that involves materials is super collaborative and super uh, you know, intensive. And so there's really four steps of this Mater uh, including materials and rugs that I wanted to kind of mention. So first, let's go with the collection and the sorting. So here I just have some images, and you know this is I'm th this is well, I'm talking about wool specifically in, in these images. But essentially, uh, when wool is collected and sorted, you know they're they're taking they're shaving the wool off the sheep, and these workers uh, are first they're washing it in rivers generally, so they'll bring the un unsorted yarn. Uh, to the rivers and they'll wash it to try to get the natural color back and we have many rugs that are undyed so this process is so important because you know, it just you always got to think of the wool like your hair and you got to treat the wool like you treat your hair when it comes to shampooing which is the washing process which we'll get to it in a bit um, when it's collected it's first kind of washed without any type of chemicals or anything just in natural water to try to get any dirt out and, and make the, the 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 wool feel a more fresh and then what sorting refers to which you can see on the, the two pictures, the, the left and the one on the bottom, or the one on the left, one on the bottom, is they comb through the yarn to pull out brush and thorns and things like that. Because remember, these sheep are grazing in the wild. So as they go through uh, you know, the woods or they go through bushes, their stuff sticks to their hair and they have thorns. And you, know, you don't wanna walk on a rug and step on a thorn. <laughs> so before we do anything with the yarn, it, after it's collected, it's sorted to take out any of the natural elements that may have been picked up in the travels of the animal that it was on. And you can see to the right, which we'll get into that a little more, how the yarn is stored after it's been sorted and after it's been spun. But I'll get into spinning in a second. Uh, so before we get into the next piece of the material collection process so that way it can be woven, uh, I wanted to talk about some different fibers and some of the fibers that Stark uses and why we use some of these. and uh, kind of the, some aspects that are important to note about all of them. So to generalize, and you know, I could spend 10 hours talking about rugs and I could dedicate five hours just talking about materials. But uh, for the purposes of the presentation and, and for this uh, course and this lesson, we simplified it a little bit to uh, a few different categories. So wool is probably by standards of the industry, the most used uh, fiber as it relates to high-end high handmade rugs, uh, but with good reason. So wool wool fiber is very cleanable, uh, and you know when you obviously when you stain a rug, it, depending on how it's dyed, which we'll get into in a second, uh, it's, it not always can get out, but it's the most cleanable of fibers. And when it comes to color, uh, there's a lot of natural colors and beautiful natural colors that are used undyed. So it, it and which ranges from cream to different types of natural browns. Uh, and you know, we sometimes will blend different types of natural fibers to achieve different looks. Uh, new, there's wool from different areas of the world, which all have different properties. So New Zealand wool, or wool from New Zealand, is the highest quality wool in existence. Um, and it's the most white, undyed. So when you collect from white sheep in New Zealand versus let's say sheep in China, the, excuse me, the wool is more white. And so what this really means is that when you're dyeing the product, the dyeing can be a lot more consistent from a you know, time and time again basis. So you know, at Stark, we have a lot of programmed rugs. And when I say programmed, we stock one rug in you know, 8x10, 9x12, 10x14, 12x15. We have about 650 designs in that structure. Um, and when we need to match the same design, same color time and time again, or do custom sizes with the same designs or same colors, wool makes it a lot easier to do that with. Uh, so the next fiber and, and the most luxurious fiber is silk. Uh, silk's great because it's really cleanable as well. It's cleanable with just water. Um, the problem or one of the, the issues when it comes to achieving a custom product using silk is 
it's really difficult to achieve like a white, white, super white color. Uh, silk by default is a little more cream. But again, just like wool, the dye matching is very, very consistent. Uh, and so if someone wants a super, super white, they're forced to maybe make a trade-off and not use silk, but use a silk substitute. So uh, silk substitutes, there's many of them. Uh, a lot of them are either cellulose based or maybe some are tree pulp based and they're, you know, uh, they're still broken down from naturally occurring things in different processes. Some of the more popular silk substitutes, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, uh, are viscose, uh, rayon, bamboo silk, tensile. You know, there's a lot of terms. You know, some companies have different terms for the same product, but all of these really refer to just different types of silk substitutes. And again, there are pros and cons. So let's talk about the pro is that you can really achieve the pure white and from a pricing standpoint, it could bring the price down a little. But from a con perspective, uh, it's a little less consistent with dye matching, and it's definitely not as cleanable. You know, viscose, untreated viscose, can be stained with water. Uh, so it's, it's very important that we, uh, you know that going into the project and you're aware of these trade-offs. Now, we definitely do things to, tr to treat these fibers prior to uh, weaving them to try to reduce the amount of uh, Sustainability or stains and make it more durable, but at the end of the day, it's not going to be as cleanable as wool or silk. To continue and to make sure I continue moving so I don't run out of time, um, we just talked about some natural fibers, right? You know, wool is naturally occurring. Uh, there are other natural fibers as a category, uh, and when I say these, you know, I'm talking about jute, hemp, sisal, linen, sun fat, and seagrass. And these are kind of essentially straw fibers. So I'm sure many of you have. Uh, purchased sisal product in the past. The sisal product is also used in a lot in machine-made product and in rolled broadloom. But uh, pros and cons, right? This is a very unique look as it relates to these natural fibers of jute, hemp, etc. Um, the colors, you can't really have too much flexibility with dyeing it. I mean, there's unbleached. It has beautiful natural tones, which are generally used. Uh, it's semi-cleanable, but it's not nearly as cleanable as wool or silk. Um, and generally, we recommend dry cleaning for any type of natural fiber. Uh, and there's a lot of variation because based on the weather conditions and how much sun there is and how much humidity there is, when the plants grow, they, they, the appearance will be different season to season. So there's a lot of variation as it relates to harvesting these fibers uh, on an annual year over year basis. Last fiber I'll mention is, or last category rather, is synthetic fibers. So these are nylon, you know, shiny nylon, pet yarns, which is essentially recycled plastic, acrylic, et cetera. So these are the most cleanable and stain resistant fibers because of the way that they're dyed, uh, which we'll get into the dyeing process in a second, but they're waterproof, you know, out, indoor outdoor products generally are synthetic fibers, uh, but there's more to a product than just being synthetic uh, of the fiber to be outdoor, you know, the backing needs to be outdoor, there needs to be drainage, things like that. Uh, but outdoor products are synthetic by nature. Uh, they won't rot because they're essentially created with chemicals. So when, as it relates to hospitality projects, or as it relates to um, different types of outdoor uses or high traffic areas, synthetic fibers is a great option, especially blended synthetic fibers. So like Axminsters as a category, uh, generally always has, or I mean, it, not generally always, but it always has synthetic fibers in the construction. So to summarize quickly, um, the fibers that we mentioned, wool, silk, some of the silk substitutes, some of the natural fibers, and some of the synthetic fibers. Uh, synthetic is the only that is really not natural. Uh, when it comes to cleanability, wool and silk is the best. Uh, actually, sorry, let me phrase that. Synthetic is the best, but of the naturally occurring ones, wool and silk is the best, and the silk substitutes and, other, and straw-based fibers clean a little. Uh, the dye matching is extremely consistent with wool, silk, and the synthetics, but not as much the silk substitutes as well as the natural fibers. And the, the natural colors of all these uh, vary, and uh, there is no natural color of synthetics because the color is created in the process of creating the fiber. Next, and I included a little bit graphic here, once the yarn is sorted, then uh, it is spun. And so you look at on the right, uh, to the left of, the, all right, the left of this uh, woman, there's all the yarn that has been collected and sorted. Now what she's doing is she is taking that yarn and the uh, wool naturally has fibers that stick to each other. So essentially she kind of, they, 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 they use this kind of retrofitted bicycle wheel to spin the yarn into uh, spools like what I have on the top right here. So, and that's used for transportation and ultimately how it's woven. 
And the way the yarn is spun creates differences in the final appearance of the product. So there's different types of twists. You can spin it all at the same speed. So the, the fiber is you know, consistent in terms of uh, the, the, how thick it is. You can uh, spin it fast and slow and be inconsistent. So it creates more of an irregularity, which in the dyeing process creates more of a, a less consistent uh, color. So sometimes you want less consistent color within the blue, you might want different shades of it. And the way that the yarn is spin and twisted ultimately uh, helps inform that. And there's a lot of variability, the normal twist, the semi-twist, high and over twisting, as well as the regular twisting. I'm not gonna go into too much detail now, but it's a very important process uh, within the rug making uh, process. Here I have a little bit of summary. And again, the point of these summaries is to give you guys a quick reference point uh, in the future, if you want to refer back to this information. So this is what you'll be getting as a handout after. Last, uh, in terms of the materials, is the ply of yarns. So uh, ply refers to essentially once the yarn is spun into these spools, then sometimes the yarn is twisted together, right? And the purpose of this is, is to, one of the main purposes rather, is to give a tweed effect. So there's single ply, which is kind of a graph-like uh, surface texture, you know, it's just a single piece of yarn that gets woven. But then oftentimes when you're trying to create kind of variations into the, in the design and the color, you can ply two, three, and even four or more yarns together to create this tweed effect. And the weaver, that once the yarn is, for, uh, this, the plying happens oftentimes uh, before or after the dyeing process, it can happen at either point. But um, the weaver is then given the yarn that's plied and then using that to do their knots or do their tufting. Next, for the next couple points, uh, I wanna talk about some of the beautiful irregularities that handmade rugs have to help you know, manage your expectations and help you manage your client's expectations when working with this type of product. So start, the first is the dyeing process. So there's really two types of you know, ways to dye or types of dye. There's vegetable dyes and synthetic or chemical dyes. And now, for those of you who have been to Juice Press or any of these juice companies, um, then if you get a kale juice that has all these different green juices in it, uh, then that's essentially what a vegetable dye is. So this green juice, when you soak yarn in green juice, kale, spinach, different types of leaves, that is what vegetable dye is, and that's how you use vegetable dye. Uh, so it's completely naturally occurring, but it's also, there's a lot of there's, there's less vari or there's more variability as it relates to um, the dyeing. So because of the seasonality of the vegetables and, and the things like, or the fruits that you're using, then it, it creates some inconsistencies uh, based on the climate, as I mentioned, like with the straw based fibers. Uh, in generally for antique rugs, this has been used because this existed way before chemical dyes. But for the most part, our new products are not done with vegetable dyes because if we're trying to match something time and time again, it's a lot harder with vegetable dyes. There's a much larger variance. Uh, and the other issue is that the color doesn't uh, get absorbed by the yarn as well. So it fades a lot quicker. If you want something to do the color not to fade, uh, then chemical and synthetic dyes is really the way to do it. It's a much more uh, consistent dye across the, the different parts of the yarn as well as time and time again. And as I kind of mentioned before, it's used for our program and custom production because we want to hit something exact we use these synthetic dyes, which are essentially you know, water with different types of um, like color dyes in it with controlled amounts. So our mills essentially uh, know what combination of what different type of color dyes are used to achieve a certain color. Next, in terms of the, uh, the method of dyeing, we, there's two main types of dyeing, again, which you really want to uh, understand as it relates to what the end result is gonna look like. So level dyeing, is essentially um, dropping something in a bucket and kind of leaving it soaking, uh, or a vat, we call it. Uh, and when we do this, it's very consistent. Uh, and antiques are not generally done with this method. But the other type of dyeing is abrash dyeing, which essentially, they're, when they're continuing to move the yarn and dip it and, and circulate it uh, as, they, as the yarn is soaking in the dye, uh, which uh, is, it, it has a much more, uh, ranging type of uh, process. And that's how you can achieve this kind of abrash look, which with antiques happens over time, but this is a way to do it for new rugs. Uh, so now let's talk about uh, the finishing. So to, to bring us back to where we are today, 
uh, where we are in the presentation in terms of the process of rug making. First, the yarn is collected, then it's sorted, then it's spun, then it's dyed, then it's plied, then it's actually woven. So all of that happens prior to the weavers receiving the product. When, when it's woven, uh, after it's woven, it's finished. And so there's a few different pieces to the finishing process. Um, I think one of the more interesting ones is the washing process. So again, I use the analogy of your hair, right? So if you think of your hair, you know, what do you do to your hair multiple times a week? You wash it, you use shampoo, you use conditioner, you keep it healthy and give it a sheen. So wool rugs or silk rugs, you know, these are fibers that are really not that different from your hair. And so the point of washing is to open up the twists and add the sheen to the yarn, uh, just like you do with your hair. Uh, generally, we use a naturally occurring nut soap, so a soap that comes you know, from different types of plants uh, to shampoo the rugs after they're woven. And this also imparts the final texture into the rugs. So there are different, different types of soaps. Some can have chemical blends in it that can achieve different types of looks. So for example, there's a certain process where for a wool and silk product, uh, you can use a certain type of soap and while you're washing it and the way it's washed is they dump buckets of the solution onto the rug and they use these wooden panels or, or rakes to kind of scrape it. Um, certain blends of uh, soap will disintegrate the wool so that way the color gets absorbed into the backing but it leaves the, the silk unaffected. Un, uh, so it creates a texture which is achieved in the washing process, not in the weaving process. And there's some new qualities that you know, it's always made antique reproduction rugs very difficult to, to control because it, that look was achieved in the washing process. They would basically beat up the rugs to make them look older. Uh, and there's some new programs and some at Stark now that we've taken, we, we've developed over the last couple of years ways to achieve that look with the texture and the, the kind of antique feeling uh, in the weaving process so that way we can control it and ultimately program it in multiple sizes and do custom off of. So antique reproduction custom is, is a new uh, initiative for us that the market hasn't seen and we're very excited about. Next, uh, one of the things in the process is the clipping and the surging. So once the rug is woven, it's unbelievable how many hands still have to touch it. So there's usually anywhere from three to six people involved in the washing process. And each rug after it's woven is gone through by multiple people on their hands and knees with scissors, possibly to cut around the design and make the design a little more uh, detailed to using tweezers and picking out any thorns or things that were missed or any inconsistencies with things that are stuck in, in the fibers. So they go through it with scissors, they clip it, they hand surge it at, at the end. So on the left is a image of someone surging it to finish the rug and make it look complete. And they use the yarn to match for the, for the most part. And then on the right, uh, you can see some women, uh, four women sitting across the width of the rug with tweezers essentially going out and pulling out different strands or different inconsistencies. So that way the product, the end result uh, really looks great. One of the most interesting things in terms of the finishing process is the touch-ups that they do. So sometimes, you know, maybe the weaver made a mistake, uh, you know, in a certain area, or maybe um, the design didn't come out exactly well, as you were expecting. So they sometimes will, will do what's called shifting the design. So on the right, someone's actually on a row by row basis. You need, those are the, so the warps are going uh, left to right in the image and the wefts are going up and down. So they're essentially taking the wefts and moving each weft one by one, row by row, to shift the design and make it look different. And that's one of the most labor intensive processes. processes. But again, it's unbelievable how many hands actually touch the rug before it's, before it's delivered to you and your client. This is just a fun picture I like to have because it shows you that no matter how amazing the rug is and how expensive it is, in these third world countries, the way it's transported is so primitive. They put it on the back of a bicycle and they'll transport it to the airport and they obviously wrap it to ensure the integrity. But um, it's, it, 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 I think it illustrates that you know, it's, it's important to understand the, where these products are made and how they're made because things inevitably go wrong with handmade product. And you know, we do whatever we can to minimize that and it doesn't happen that often. But you know, it, it, understanding this and helping communicate to your client the variations, the, the, the process involved, which in, informs you know, why it takes so long, are all important pieces to help make your project successful. So I know I'm running, starting to run out of time, and I, I know I can, I'll go a couple more minutes, but I'm nearing the end, so please bear with me. Um, so next is the, some weaving and design variations. And 
so that's just a quick image of weavers sitting at the loom. Uh, on the right, they're uh, weaving it. Uh, on the left, that's after a row has been woven. That gentleman is holding a beater, which is used to create the vertical density of the, the rug by beating after they, they weave the, or they, in this case, they knotted the row. Then they put the weft in, the next weft, and then they beat it to create more density. So there's a, certain, a few different things in the weave that create this variation. Uh, so as it relates to the raw materials, the thickness of the yarn, which we talked about, which is done in the spinning process, uh, as well as the thickness of the warp and wefts, ultimately create uh, irregularities. Uh, in the, this is irregularities in the material, uh, which ultimately, for depending on what you're trying to achieve, uh, the thickness and thinness can help achieve that or actually hurt if you're trying to achieve that. And also as it relates to the weave, I talked about the beating of the wefts, which is the vertical density, as well as the setting of the warps. So that's the lateral de density, you know, how spaced apart each uh, warp is. Uh, the tighter they are, uh, and the more consistent the densities are uh, when, it, as it relates to the vertical versus the horizontal, can create different motifs, different inconsistencies. You know, if it's not consistent, then you might not be able to do a square line. You know, it needs to have the same vertical and horizontal density, so that way you can do a, a diagonal. If it's not the same, then the diagonal might look a little shaky. Next, and starting to wrap up, um, number nine, and I think this is one of the mo mo most important pieces, is the cost perception. So handmade product, just because it's handmade, does not necessarily mean that it is too expensive. There are many things that impact the price, as we kind of talked about, from the quality to the weave, to the materials, or where it's made. And I, I, I like this little graphic on the right, like buy, me, buy please, it's too expensive, or what do you want, what can you afford, and what's in the middle? Um, there's a lot of variations, and just because a product is handmade does not necessarily mean that it's too expensive. And when you, it refers to custom, you know, we're constantly downweaving our own designs in different qualities to, to achieve the budget and the time frame that our clients demand for their clients. Uh, so when you're doing custom, it, it, there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to price as it relates to handmade. Now, not to say that it's, you know, it's usually more expensive than machine made, but at the same time, it doesn't mean it's too expensive. It could be very similarly priced. Point number 10 how to make this project a success. So the whole purpose of this presentation is to help you make your projects a success. And the most important thing is managing your, your, your client's expectation as it relates to this. Like we said in the beginning, the expectations as it, as it uh, relates to the design, uh, expectations as it relates to the durability, to the timeframes, obviously to the price. But again, emphasizing the artistry as well as the collaborative uh, involvement of so many different people from so many places with so many different languages. Um, it's, it's important to set those expectations up front and make sure people understand that they're getting a handmade product that is intentionally not perfect. Now, granted, it can't be the wrong color or the design can't be wrong, but if the line wiggles a little or there's, you know, a slight variation, you know, up under 5% in terms of the color dye and the color matching, that's to be expected. And ultimately, Embracing this beautiful nature of these imperfect, perfectly imperfect products you know, is the only way it'll be a success. But most importantly, leveraging your vendor's expertise. So in 45 minutes, there's only so much I can talk to you about as it relates to this product to help you understand, to help you communicate to your clients. But I can promise you, Stark, as well as other vendors in the industry, they're happy to help you. We're happy to help you. Our sales staff is trained on this stuff. Our production team is trained on this stuff. We have different ex subject matter experts depending on the type of weave, depending on the type of uh, the region that it comes from. You know, one of the benefits of uh, working with Stark is that because of our scale and our size with our 17 showrooms in the US and our international distribution in London with our showroom, et cetera, you know, we have created departments that specialize in different parts of the process, from the communication to the mills, to the quality control of the mills, where our team goes four times a year, different areas to inspect the mills, make sure they're upholding our quality standards, as well as overseeing actual production for custom projects, et cetera, leverage the expertise of companies like Stark uh, or the salespeople that you work with at Stark. Now, education, knowledge is power in today's world. There's so much misinformation in the world, especially when you just search online for random things with no way to vet the information, which I know your clients are probably doing and bringing you suggestions of things that are overpriced and that you would never buy. Uh, having this education from the vendors who are dealing with these mills directly, uh, it, it's super important. And you now again, 
our strategy from a, from a custom perspective is to be the most important partner to any mill that we work with that so we have the leverage and we have the power to you know run 24 hour shifts where we have three different shifts working around the clock to get things done quicker or building custom looms that are 22 feet wide so that way there's no seam on a 22 by 55 foot rug or whatever crazy demands you or your clients might have you know it's important to know that vendors can often achieve that star can always achieve it i like to say if you can dream it we can weave it but if we can't do it, we'll tell you to manage your expectation properly. So as I kind of mentioned, there are some additional resources available to you, which you'll get after the presentation. Uh, one is learning about our custom development process, interviewing different salespeople at our company, different account managers, our head of product. Uh, there's a fun saved Instagram story on YouTube, which I had a lot of fun making. So hopefully you have some fun watching it. Uh, and then also just a kind of a slew of random clips that I generally use at the end of this presentation to uh, highlight and showcase videos of how this actually works. Um, and so if you remember those 10 things, uh, most importantly, the last one, which is managing your client's expectations and leveraging your vendor's expertise, uh, that is how you make projects successful. That is how you get comfortable working with handmade products and custom product development. And I can assure you, you know, with a changing design ecosystem and the emergence of the do-it-yourself culture, the one thing that I'm very confident will stay uh, and will continue to make professional designers or highlight professional designers value is these custom made to order products with all this flexibility with with from a price point perspective to a uniqueness perspective and so uh please just ask and remember those 10 things and you'll get some information and uh thank you all for listening i hope i didn't bore you too much i hope you learned a couple things and now i believe we're turning it over for some questions which tara is going to moderate for me to answer Thank you so much, Chad. So many interesting things to learn here today. Thank you for taking the time. Um, for those of you who have questions, please, please submit them now. We see one question, Chad, for you so far. Sure. Um, we have a question from Andy. Um, Andy's asking, what rug types would you recommend most for someone who has mold sensitivities? Who has what? Mold sensitivities. Mildew, mold sensitivity. Sure. So, um, so the number one pro the number one fiber to use to avoid that is synthetic fibers, and specifically the, the number the the only way to truly avoid mold uh, mold is using a synthetic product that has drainage and it has basically synthetic products throughout every piece of the puzzle. So we didn't really talk too much in this presentation about the backing or the different ways to finish product because we suck to handmade and you know as it relates to knots there is no backing but um if things you know if 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 there's not proper drainage because of the backing largely then mold can build up and synthetic fibers can always be removed but when uh mold builds up in wool fibers for example if it builds up too long it could ruin the product so the fiber i would recommend are things synthetic uh solution dyed fibers which is one thing we didn't get too much into, but essentially the, how the colors are created with the synthetic fibers, since it's a, it's a, it's a synthetic fiber, the colors created at the same time, and it's molecularly bolded, uh, bonded the color to the fiber, so the color is consistent and there cannot be uh, mold. So synthetic fibers and synthetic backings and outdoor products or products that are suitable for outdoor would be the safest bet there. Great, thank you. We have some more questions pouring in. Um, the next question is from Megan. And Megan is asking, what are the best rug types for newborns? R but best rug types for newborns? Yeah. Um, well, fun designs, for sure. I mean, you want something that's <laughs> fun. Um, but I think, you know, because newborns are often times on the ground, I would recommend softer fibers. You know, wool is my go-to. I know that there are some wool allergies uh, and people have developed them. It's interesting. Some of the people at my company who deal with rugs have wool allergies and they might they have to put gloves on when they're dealing with the product. Um, but I would recommend wool generally because for the most part, that is, it's a natural fiber, as we mentioned. Uh, it's, you know, it doesn't have fumes in the, in the, the process of creating the dye. It's not like there's going to be anything bad there for you. But the alternative to if you're really worried about, you know, I don't know if my newborn has uh, has an allergy to anything yet. You're still trying to achieve that softness. There are some silk substitutes, which the trade-off, as we mentioned, you're making is you know, there might be a little less durable. And so, you know, if your newborn is uh, taking bathroom breaks on the rug, then the synthetics uh, might not, the silk substitutes rather, might not be the best way to go. But they're definitely soft. 
And then obviously the synthetics are the most durable. So it really depends on what your goal is as a, a parent of a newborn uh, and, and what your you know, understanding of uh, the allergy potential might be for your child. But I recommend softness because they're always on the ground. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Darlene is asking, what would you say is the durability of wool and bamboo silk? As it compares to each other? Yeah. So I'll and slide back. As it compares to other materials. Sure. So um, I'll go back into the material slide just to kind of summarize as I talk. Mm -hmm. um, one second. So um, wool is, as I mentioned, one of the most durable, one of the most cleanable uh, fibers. And we generally, you know, most of our products are wool or have some sort of wool in it. Uh, bamboo silk, which is very similar to viscose, which is, falls under the silk substitutes category. So to go back to the bottom here, there's different types of uh, silk substitute fibers that are either cellulose or tree pulp based. Um, those are not nearly as durable and we can, we try to treat them to make them more durable. But at the end of the day, they're going to stain more easily than wool. Um, and, but again, it's trade-offs, right? So if you want to achieve a pure white look, then you're going to need a silk substitute. Um, but from a durability perspective and a cleanability perspective, wool is much better than silk substitutes. What we found is that the, uh, the silk substitutes are great when they're blended with wool or when they're used to highlight certain aspects of the design. So if you do a, a wool silk substitute blend and you do some sort of silk to outline the design or silk substitute to outline the design, whereas the main features of the design are wool, you know, it's, you still have the durability of the wool because that's the majority of the rug is comprised of wool. But the silk substitutes, which has a little more shine, uh, it, it highlights certain aspects of it, but isn't overwhelming. So that way the product overall is still very durable. Great. So on that note, exactly. Um, Eileen had a great question. She asked, what are the best materials to use as alternatives to wool and silk specifically for look and feel? Uh, what are the best alternatives to wool and silk? <laughs> it, it's a very, it's, it's, it, again, it really boils down to what you're trying to achieve. So if you want a wool and silk product, and, but you don't want to pay the price tag of wool and silk, then you use a wool silk alternative, or sorry, you use a silk alternative, a silk substitute, but no silk substitute is going to be as cleanable as silk. So just like everything in your life, there are always trade-offs. And that's why I really recommend to my 10th point, working with a sales rep on a project to project basis to try to understand the application of the product and where it's going to go what the biggest uh, and most important things are to your client, whether it's price, durability, et cetera. You know, they have some really good synthetic fibers now. and We do use like a, a shiny nylon, we call it, uh, which is essentially a synthetic fiber that looks a lot like silk, but that costs less and is a lot more cleanable than viscose. It's actually more cleanable than silk, but it's, it's, it's actually shinier. So the shiny nylon, it's a nylon fiber, obviously, and it is crazy shiny like it's unbelievable how shiny the fiber is so I, I that's i think a great alternative to silk if you're trying to bring a price down but um for wool you know you can use different types of synthetics but nothing's really going to feel like wool you know you have the more expensive types of wool or less expensive types of wool to like new zealand wool as i mentioned compared to chinese wool which is less expensive compared to like mohair uh and cashmere but it, 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 there's no real great substitute for wool you'd have to go into the synthetic category which the properties are very very different Great, thank you. Um, another question. So we know that designers, are, a lot of designers are designing spaces for pet friendly homes. Um, do you know of any good ways to repair wool rugs, for example, which have been damaged by pets' males? Sure, so uh, I think it's, it's, it's good to understand why if a pet you know, has an accident on the rug, it stains it. So when, it, when a wool product, or basically when any of the wool silk or silk substitute products are dyed. Um, you're, remember, as I kind of mentioned, you're soaking the yarn in, in the dye and the yarn is absorbing the dye. So the color is basically just like soaked. If you soak a white t-shirt in a, you know, a red liquid, it's gonna turn red, right? Um, so when a dog, let's say, urinates on a rug, the acidic value of the urine is what ruins the fastness of the color to the, the yarn. So uh, with any type of wool, naturally occurring fiber, wool, silk, silk substitutes, or natural fibers like sisal, jute, et cetera, the, the, the number one thing to do is immediately blot something out 
you know, don't scrape it in because then you'll get it further into the, the yarn and, and, and possibly into the backing, is always blot it uh, and then call an expert. Because depending on how you try to maintain it, you know, we have cleaning kits that you can use at home, but I always recommend dry cleaning and always having an expert look at it because you don't want to accidentally make it worse. And what I found for wool and silk is you can, you can clean those with water. So sometimes what I'll do is whether it's water or seltzer, I'll blot it out. I'll put some water or seltzer on it. I'll blot it a couple times, try to get this as, out as much as I can. Uh, but then usually it's, it's, it's depending on how quickly you address it is how quickly you can get it out. So with urine especially, that has to get taken care of right away. Otherwise, the, the color is not going to absorb. Uh, the color is going to fade. But the best product to use are synthetic fibers that are solution dyed. So we didn't talk too much about solution dyeing, but that's again, as I briefly mentioned, that's the process. In the process of creating the synthetic fibers, since they're chemically created, the yarn, the color is selected, and then the color is molecularly uh, fasted to the yarn. So outdoor products, which are UV rated. You can you know, wash it down with a hose because the color is not going to ruin the, the fastness. The uh, urine or any type of acidic liquid is not going to ruin the fastness. So if that's your primary concern, synthetic fiber is, is really the only option you have. Uh, but after synthetics, wool and silks, because they're a little more cleanable, when it comes to the silk substitutes, if you put water on a silk substitute, it's going to stain. So you can only imagine what urine is going to do. Great. Um, we have a lot more questions, but we only have time for one more. Um, on the topic of cleaning rugs, Michael asked, how often should handmade rugs be professionally cleaned? And what is the best recommended method of cleaning based on the materials in the rug? Sure. So uh, the frequency at which the rug should be cleaned is very much dependent on, how, on the application of the rug and, and the use of the rug. So, you know, if you have a rug that is in a summer home that is in a, a room that no one ever goes in. And so people go to the house two months a year and people are in the room probably five times a year. You know, vacuuming it is something that should happen regularly uh, because just like with pets, you know, wool sheds. <laughs> so um, by vacuuming and, you know, that is one way to ultimately stop the shedding. Once the shedding is done, New Zealand wool sheds less than Chinese wool. Um, so vacuuming is important, but how often you should get it professionally cleaned is really dependent on the usage. And from a very high level and kind of a generalist point of view, the fewer times, the better, because the more times you touch it, the more opportunities you have for creating these inconsistencies or fading the color. You know, if you wash, if you dry clean it twice a year after 10 years, and if you dry clean it 20 times, that's a lot of wear and tear on the rug. Um, but dry cleaning is usually the way to go based on the fiber. Um, you know, synthetic fibers and, and outdoor products, indoor outdoor products, you can clean as much as you want. You can use a hose to clean. You can use bleach. That's really up to you if there's ever a stain on it. When it comes to the wool and silk fibers, you know, if it's a high traffic area, maybe once every, you know, three to five years, uh, if not longer, if there's no stains on it. But obviously when there's stains, take care of it right away by blotting and then calling professional. And there's you know, many different professional cleaning services. You know, Stark has a, on the, East Coast, we have startcleaning.com, which is a cleaning service that you know, we'll come inspect it and we'll clean it for you guys. And obviously, if you bought the product from us, you can go through your account manager and we always service our own product, but we're always happy to service other people's product because you know, it's, it's, it's our, our responsibility, we feel, to help make sure that people are happy with rugs, even if they didn't get the rug from us. So we're, we have that initiative, which is not national, but it's on the, across the entire East Coast. So to summarize that answer, you know, it, it really depends on the, the wear and tear. But synthetic fibers, you clean as much as you want. The natural fibers, I would, I would hesitate to clean for no reason, uh, unless there's really a stain. Perfect. So, so that's uh, all the questions we can take today. But Chad, thank you so much for your time. This was really informative. Um, for the people who still have questions, um, what do you think is the best way to address them? Um, well, there's many ways. One is... Every designer in the world can email me. <laughs> See Stark at starcarpet.com. I am happy to, to send you information, uh, to ha answer any questions you have. Again, the email address is C for Chad, Stark for Stark at starcarpet.com. Um, but if you don't want to go that route, uh, I recommend you know, reaching out to a Stark showroom near you. If you don't have a relationship with anyone, <clears throat> just walk in. Uh, email me if you want me to introduce you to someone, the manager in your territory, um, or 
if you have a relationship with someone, you know, you can ask your salespeople because again, you know, this is all information that uh, there are people who know a lot more about this than I do. And some of our salespeople, you know, I've been, as I mentioned, full-time six years, but we have account managers around the country have been with us 25 years, 35 years. So they for sure know more about this than me. And just ask an expert and anyone who's on the sales floor at Stark, we consider an expert because we look at us ourselves in ways like doctors, where you go to a doctor mm-hmm. with a problem that you need a solution for, whether you feel sick, et cetera. You know, we're in the business of solving design challenges and design problems. And you have a, you know, an issue or a problem and we need to come up with a solution. That's our job. We enjoy that. We thrive in that. And so reach out to your local Stark showroom, email your account manager or email me, cstark at starkcorporate.com. Hopefully I get a hundred emails, That'd be, uh, hundreds of emails. That'd be great. I would love to answer those. Give me like more than 10 minutes to answer them, but I'm happy to answer them and, and get you guys the answers you need to help make your project a success. Perfect. Thank you so much. So we'll send through an email following this presentation with the recording and with Chad's email address, address so you can um, bug him with all of your questions. And we'll also follow up with the, the video links that Chad shared in this presentation. Uh, so thank you, Chad, so much. We hope to see you sometime soon. And have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you, Tara. Bye. Take care. Um, so for those of you who are still um, still live um, and you are curious to learn more about Ivy, um, I'm going to actually introduce my colleague, Risa, who's going to take the next 15 minutes to show you what Ivy is all about, what the software looks like, and how you can use it for your business management needs. So just hang tight for one minute and I will present Risa. Hi Risa. Hi everyone, how are you? Great, great. So let's get started on showing everyone what Ivy's all about. Great, awesome. I hope you guys all had a blast learning so much information about and their awesome carpets. I used to spec their stuff all the time. So hopefully now you have a little bit more education so that you can properly sell this product to your clients. And I am going to do a brief introduction of Ivy. Those of you who are already using Ivy, feel free to stay on. And those of you, and and tell us how much you love Ivy and how it's changed your business. And those of you who aren't yet using Ivy, um, definitely, if you have questions, you can plug them into the questions box. And I will make sure to catch a couple of those questions at the end of the session, or you can always book a call with me directly and we can chat more. So without further ado, here is Ivy, and you should be able to see my screen right now. Awesome. So first things first, I know designers use all sorts of different softwares. I used to run an interior design firm. I struggled between QuickBooks and Excel. I tried a lot of other softwares. They didn't work for me and the way my firm works. So Ivy is a community and business management tool that will help streamline all of the moving parts and have you be able to just focus and be in one place. First things first, I know we all hate tracking time. That's really not you, you're not alone. (laughs) So let me go ahead and show you right here how you can track your time. Okay, and you should be able to select your project and add your service right here, add your description and press the start button. The great amazing news is we just launched an app and the app will let you track time on the go. So there's there's a lot of steps to running a profitable business and I talked about this in an event last night. The first thing is track your time, even if you're not billing out hourly so that you can understand your over, overall sense of profitability. So 100% track your time um, and you can easily go in and you can generate a time billing invoice. So you're not invoicing at 2 a.m. You're not reinventing the wheel, creating an Excel spreadsheet. You're literally just clicking this button, clicking generate invoice and you can send this for online Online payment. Um, you can take big transfer or credit card. The money will show up in your bank account in one to two business days. Pretty quick, pretty easy. Looks really professional. Just so you can see what this looks like when your client receives this. This is what it looks like. And the client can just click pay now. They can do it on the go. It will be a game changer for you. Okay. And 
the best part about Ivy, I think, and maybe that's because I'm biased, is that when you're going into creating your proposal, you can easily clip items from a vendor's website. So right here, do you see that little Ivy leaf right here? You can just click into it and the hand will turn blue and it will allow you to clip the product from the vendor's website. How awesome is that? And I'm right here on Stark's website, so you can pick that special carpet uh, after you have so much knowledge and your client's gonna buy it you can just clip it right from um, chad's website start you can select your product product title you can categorize it you can add your cost you can add your markup and you can even say okay i want that item to be fifteen thousand dollars and it will tell you what to mark it up at you can also add your vendor i just type in stark and it pops up right there i have all of my information already in my ivy account and definitely 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 it's pretty amazing because you can add a description and you can add it directly to the project that you're working on so that it will pop right up and then you can add all of the vendor details so i'm going to save the product right here okay and then once that saves it will there we go and i'm going to go to proposal and it's going to pop right up so i can just go to create new proposal and there's my start carpet and i just click that little button and um, let's say i have some other art i want to source for my client you can also add services in here as well you can save these services so it's really nice and will save you a lot of time um 150 percent you can ask for a deposit by percentage or by dollar amount and you can also go in and save this proposal and you can ask your client to approve the proposal by line item if you want to show them the purchase fee percentage you can do that too there's a lot of flexibility with ivy so definitely um the great thing about ivy is that we work with our interior designers that are using our software and they tell us oh i would love to have this we're very open to feedback and we really understand how a designer truly works and our system works because we know designers all run their businesses very differently um it works in the way that you run your business you can also add an attachment plug in your contract right there so really streamlining your overall workflow sending out the proposal collecting the funds from your client in the system once you get the money you can click and you can even have them view tear sheets which look really professional again no more you doing this cutting clipping together screenshots on your desktop have a million screenshots this just looks really professional really organized shows your client's price so you're not using a vendor's tear sheet and then once you get that money you can go ahead and create your purchase orders and vendors i'm telling you will love you because they don't want a million emails from you oh i mean this color i mean this you're gonna get one formal purchase order from you and then they're gonna go in there you can pay them and they'll have all the information you can plug in the estimated ship date everything will then fall onto a project management calendar you can have to-do lists on there again literally centralizing your workflow having all of your team members be in one place on the go because ivy's in the cloud you can see your calendar ivy even creates a project schedule for you what a true game changer you can easily from here download this to excel download your ff and e schedule this is beautiful because this took me so much time. I can't even tell you. I used to manually pull my hair out when I was manually creating these documents. Upload all of your clients, upload all of your vendors. So if you already have that nice big long vendor list, you can save all of your usernames and passwords in here. And then you also are creating your own product library. <clears throat> so every single item that you clip will be saved. You can save it or not save it. You can delete it if you don't want it anymore, if it's out of stock. But now you don't have to waste time going back to the Pinterest board and then clicking in here. It's all here in one place. Ivy is very easy to use, very easy to set up.
you can add your team members, you can access our industry webinars, you can access our training, you get a dedicated account manager as well, and you get access to our private Facebook group. So these are all really amazing features that you can do within Ivy. I definitely want to share more with you, but in the meantime, I just want to um, kind of close with that. Um, definitely come to any of our events. We have a whole event lineup in the next four weeks. We'd love to see you at one of our events. Really, we want to help you take your business to the next level. We want to connect you with your peers. We want to help you know, Ivy really is a knowledge exchange. So we want to help give you a place where you're comfortable to share information, receive information, and, and really get you to that point and empower you to get your business to where it should be. So I'm gonna throw it back to Tara and see if we have any questions. And if we don't have questions live, it's okay. Um, I know we might have a lot of questions and we might not be able to get to them. So I definitely um, just keep in mind that you can email me Tara will stick in my email address. It's just Risa, R-E-I-S-A at IV.co. Um, and we will see, um, Tara, are you there? Do we have any questions? Yes, yes, I'm here with you. I'm going to take a look at some of the questions for you. Just gonna type one second. Um, Tony asked, can any vendor be added to my vendor list or just um, places on IV? So if you have a vendor list, you can actually import um, all of those vendors into your IV account. And when you're specifying that product, like when I showed you, I clicked start, you can actually add a vendor there too. Great. Um, Michael asked, can you add drawings like plans, elevations, and sections to the client in the IV program? Great question. Yes, you can. There's actually under each project a folder where you can add attachments and on each proposal and each invoice, you can also add your documents to that actual proposal. So the client gets it and it's one email with the proposal and the drawings. Great. Um, Sherry is asking, is there a way to itemize? For example, um, let's say you had 22 windows and blinds can I show each product for each window so what I believe Shari is asking you Risa is can you create um a grouped proposal yes yeah grouped line items yes you can so you can actually if you have custom window treatments or a custom sofa you can actually group those items together you can show your client the grouping or you can hide that grouping and Sherry I'm happy to discuss that in more depth as well great and let's see if there are any more questions. Oh, let's say you need um, some more information, like video tutorials on how to best use IV features. How can you do that? Great question. So you actually get a dedicated account manager with your IV account. We are real people behind the scenes, so it does take a little bit of time, but our team is amazing. I just had, I'm here in our Orange County office. Um, one of our gals said, I'm never going on vacation again because I have 35 emails I need to get back. We do get back to you pretty quickly. And 35 emails is, is really great. So you get that dedicated account manager with your IV account um, and more, more than happy to talk about um, if you have direct questions about what else comes with your IV account, you get access to the app you get you can integrate with quickbooks online there's so much that comes with that pricing package perfect and speaking of the app uh, courtney asked when is the IV app coming and it is out do you want to say a little bit about the mobile app yeah so it's actually oh it's out this is my phone i wonder if you can see this and it's actually live it's real there is an IV app i don't know how well you can see that but um very exciting yes in the app right now, you can track your time and you can track to-do list items. So if you need help downloading the app, feel free to email us and we can tell you how to do that. Perfect. Um, that's all the questions we have for today, but if you have any more questions specifically about how to use Ivy, you can email Risa. Her email address is reisa at ivy.co. Um, if you're currently an Ivy member now and you have some more questions about how to use Ivy, you can email support at ivy.co. Um, I'm Tara, you can email me at tara at ivy.co. Uh, the door is always open. We love speaking to designers on a daily basis. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in today. Risa, thank you for your time today. And we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you.